SCP-001, Past and Future, Part 1. The SCP Foundation constantly finds itself besieged from every direction by enemies and threats, both human and inhuman. These are threats to the Foundation itself, the state of normalcy on Earth, and humanity in general. Every so often, along comes a threat greater than any else for a variety of reasons. If you've been following this series, you're no stranger to a multitude of existence-ending threats and the different ways the Foundation might deal with them. As we dive into this one, another SCP-001 proposal, it's important to remember that there's no such thing as a concrete canon timeline in the SCP universe, so feel free to take this one as just a standalone story. We'll be starting things by actually looking at another SCP, SCP-2798, which is an anomalous energy field being generated by the Earth since 1971. This field was the result of a Foundation project first initiated in 1954 for the purpose of containing SCP-001. In this effort, it has been partially successful in improving the effects of 001, but since 2005, the field has been diminishing and is expected to fail entirely in the near future. SCP-2798 does cause a number of harmful side effects to significant numbers of people, but the Foundation has deemed these to be less harmful overall than failing to contain 001. The Foundation believes that 2798 works to contain 001 by causing it to perceive Earth as a singular living entity. This would affect the intentions of 001 and reduce the focus of its actions, although from a scientific perspective, the Foundation has no idea how that works. SCP-001 was first discovered in 1953, after which the Foundation set out to immediately contain it, utilizing several anomalies as part of Project Serapis. These anomalies include SCP-158, a device capable of essentially removing a person's soul from their body, SCP-447, a green sphere that causes highly redacted effects to dead bodies, SCP-310, a candle that causes any flammable object to come into contact with its flame to burn regardless of attempts to stop it, and SCP-1714, a mathematical proof that attempts to create a mathematical framework for the analysis of reality-altering anomalies. These are obviously a rather diverse selection of anomalies, but all of them were used in the creation or manipulation of a compound designated Z21 Violet. The souls taken by SCP-158 to form the precursor chemicals for the compound were originally taken from cattle, but these proved ineffective, so the Foundation made an agreement with some partners within the UK government to find sources from the aftermath of several military engagements in British Kenya. SCP-2570, an anomaly that produces an extremely corrosive substance, was utilized to dig a borehole into the Earth's upper mantle off the coast of Mozambique. Approximately 1400 cubic kilometers of compound Z21 violet were then injected into the upper mantle, which then spread across the entire planet, creating the energy field. As mentioned, this worked to contain SCP-001, which we still haven't learned about, but it also has caused a number of other side effects. The Foundation has been working to alleviate these effects, although they're working more on extending the duration of the energy field due to the threat of 001. One effect has been labeled as Transcendent Identity Disorder, a mental disorder discovered by the Foundation in the early 60s that is indistinguishable from dissociative identity disorder, as far as medical professionals outside of the Foundation are concerned. It, however, is a condition in which an individual periodically shares memories, experiences, thoughts, and sensory input generated by another individual, who is unaware of these effects. This condition pops up among populations based on fluctuations in the intensity of the energy field, with an average incident rate of around 0.03% among the world's population, most of them within 500 kilometers of the borehole. They are treated by mainstream psychiatry in the same manner as dissociative identity disorder, and no known treatment exists. 
Another effect, more global than the last, is an overall erosion in the world population's willingness to participate in large-scale, coordinated action. So far, this effect is only noticeable on the level of the nation-state model, in which voter turnout rates, instability indicators, proportional share of representation in reactionary political parties in world legislatures, and occurrences of violence directed at the state have all been affected based on the intensity of the energy field. Temporary increases in the power of the field are believed to have influenced the outcomes of several parliamentary elections, and has seemed to permanently affect political landscapes worldwide since the early 2010s. A third effect is the propagation of anomalous energy fields in other celestial bodies, specifically the Moon, Mars, Saturn, and a comet in orbit around Pluto. The field around the Moon was first discovered in 1979, but eventually deteriorated and disappeared entirely in 2005. The Foundation has no idea how these fields manifested, but they are much weaker than 2798, and thus do not have the same effect on 001. They do however suspect that there is a connection between the decay of the field on the moon and the sudden deterioration of SCP-2798. These effects have generated a number of public informational risks, both due to 2798's omnipresent nature and its poorly understood effects on mass consciousness. We're given a few documents that are believed to be attributable to the effects of the energy field, and were suppressed by the Foundation. The first is a news article about a man in Ontario, Canada, that was detained after digging a 10 foot deep hole in a vacant lot in his neighborhood. Witnesses described him as digging a hole at a frantic pace with a spade in the late evening, and that he refused to acknowledge any attempts at communication, and that he was highly agitated. Police were summoned when he started a portable auger drill that he had taken down into the hole with him and emergency responders were later called to cordon off the area after an unknown chemical substance was found in the hole. The man has been remanded for a psychiatric evaluation, and the Foundation notes that this event occurred at the same time as heightened measurable energy levels 70 kilometers above Ontario. The second document is a Model Train Society newsletter from 1978, distributed across the Midwestern US. The newsletter notes that Miles under our feet, everything we have ever known has been taught that life is a curse, and that 8,000 souls have been melted down to create an obscenity that we cling to until vengeance comes. Most of the letter contains other information related to model trains, but there is a congratulations for Jim Lucas, who is retiring after 30 years at the bottling plant and will be lucky enough to die before the end comes. The newsletter ends by saying that a rotting corpse will attract living predators, and asks if it's better to putrefy for a hundred generations than to die screaming once. The third document is an anonymous flyer that was distributed in Pakistan in 1968. The flyer reads, Attention, all are one people, tomb at the center of the earth, open the gates if mercy is upon you. All are one, and I have scratched at the coffin until our nails came off. It sees me. Open the gates. The fourth and final document is an exchange between two members on an internet dating site. The first user, Gia51513, asks the other for their age, sex, and location. The other individual, their name redacted, responds, but then Gia says that they were Keone, and that they were ripped apart and buried alive. They were beautiful, and are everywhere now. The other individual says that that's a little weird, but Gia asks them if they want to have intercourse, and calls them by their name, despite the other user not providing their actual name. Gia says that it's okay, they used to like doing that, but they're everywhere now. The other individual tries to close the window, but finds themselves unable to do so. Gia goes on to say that they scream with their voices, and now they were Akina, and it's like being thousands of people at once, too. Gia says that it doesn't stop, and asks the other user if they want to know what Serapis is. 
The other user says that they are pulling the plug on their computer now and says to leave them alone. Despite the user signing out, Gia continues and tells them to dig a hole so that they can hear them scream with all voices. Gia says to dig and this world will be theirs before leaving a heart symbol and signing out as well. The Foundation has a few plans in mind for when 2798 eventually fails completely. The first was to perform a mass evacuation of Earth to nearby planets, but this was rejected for not being technologically feasible. The second was to negotiate with 001 itself, which was also rejected due to being unworkable. The third was to systematically weaponize a number of anomalies, and this one was approved initially before being rejected sometime later for being impossible. The fourth plan was to recreate Project Serapis, likely with some improvements, but this too was rejected due to the escalation of secondary effects. Finally, the last plan they have is the worldwide distribution of potassium cyanide ampules, essentially a mass suicide. The vote for this one is still pending. The last piece of information for 2798 is a notification that 2798 has finally ceased to function, and SCP-001 is now uncontained. Worldwide emergency protocols are now in effect, providing us a nice segue into SCP-001 itself. The file for 001 is broken up into a number of separate documents, and opens up by revealing the O5 Council vote for the 5th Contingency Plan, the one involving mass distribution of cyanide pills. 6 of the 13 voted yes, 4 voted no, and 3 abstained, resulting in the motion failing, likely due to requiring a unanimous decision for something of that scale. The first document is called Harbinger, and starts with O52 putting a surgical mask on her face and putting on a pair of sterile slippers. She asks a Dr. Zhang if this is the extent of protocol for interacting with a 400 year old man, but Zhang isn't really concerned with protocol at a time like this. O52 asks what could he possibly know about a time like this, as he practically lives in a separate world from them in an existential isolation facility. Zhang says that overseers aren't even allowed to be here, but she tells him not to ask why that rule is being waived. Some time passes as they wait in silence before they're allowed to pass through a hermetically sealed door. Before they enter, O52 tells Zhang that she was never here. They enter into another room where they find an ancient looking man in a hospital bed, connected to a mass of wires, tubes, and medical equipment. O52 starts the conversation with this man by saying, Goodbye SCP-411. 411 is an anomalous man that ages backwards, thus the remark about him being 400 years old, and more importantly, his memory also functions in reverse. He can't remember anything in the past, as this hasn't happened to him yet, but he can recall things in the future, since for him, they've already occurred. Due to his advanced age, however, his memory is spotty, often forgetting things more than a few months into the future. People that communicate with him have to be trained in how to do so, as he will essentially have conversations backwards chronologically, meaning that he will provide answers to questions before they're asked. He's a valuable asset to the Foundation, but they have to be careful not to cause any paradoxes when speaking with him. She started the conversation by saying goodbye, as for him that would be the last thing she'd say. The ancient man speaks into a small microphone taped next to his mouth, and says, You are the first of the quiet times. Some peace and quiet, finally. She decides that this alone isn't the answer to any questions she might ask, so she waits as he continues. He says, Suffering cruelty, the currency by which the world is purchased. Everything that you are is a reflection of this. You will remember the true nature of cruelty in time. She has a list of questions that she had prepared to ask him, and it's important that she didn't deviate from the list at any point. 
She asks him, what is the price that they will need to pay for this? So his response was suffering and cruelty. He continues and says that our kind did not just appear in his path, and he recognizes our faces. Our faces are not full of fear and desperation like the faces of his recent years, but instead they're full of joy and happiness, illumined by a different star. The idea of a different star is consistent with data that the Foundation has received from a recent test of SCP-2003, a device that allows someone to temporarily visit a possible future. Humanity is currently plagued with the threat of SCP-001, but it seems that there is a possibility that they might be able to escape it after all, to a planet orbiting a different star, if the Time Machine and SCP-411 are to be believed. She asks the question that would prompt that answer from him, if humanity exists in his past, meaning our future. Despite her relief at the prospect of a possible future for humanity, she's unnerved by the conversation in general, as it doesn't feel right. Many anomalies provided the Foundation some sort of glimpse of the future, but these glimpses were all warped in some way by the anomaly generating them and thus they were ignored by the Foundation for planning purposes. O5-2 felt that they needed to make an exception in this case. The man speaks again, saying, A barren rock, home to terrors beyond imagining. It is well that life has fled. It is even better that life for others continues far away from this place. She knows this is an easy question to figure out, and asks if there is a future for humanity on Earth. The answer, of course, suggests that there isn't, that Earth will become a barren rock, but humanity will flee to a place far away. That question was the last one she had planned on asking, and ultimately she didn't learn a great deal. She waits a moment longer to see if he'll say anything else, hoping for some more info, as she plans on bringing forth an argument to the O5 Council the next day. The man speaks again, saying, The planet of hands. This is what we are to speak of. I am from there, you know. As are you, child. You shall know more of it in time. I am glad to be here now instead. 052 doesn't know what to make of this and just sighs, remarking that he must be going senile, which isn't surprising. She briefly ponders if she should reevaluate his other answers but decides against it, as she believes in the chance of humanity's future. The man then greets her and says, unlike him, she'll be home soon. She greets him as well, and then turns and leaves. Next, we're given an actual document for SCP-001, so that we can finally learn what exactly it is that's threatening the planet. We're informed that SCP-001 is a sapient entity or group of entities capable of initiating and exerting control over anomalous phenomena. They are hostile, and are believed to be motivated by a desire to cause profound distress and suffering to humanity. This includes undermining large-scale human institutions and eroding belief in a rational consensus reality. Existence of anomalous activity on Earth dates back to the beginnings of recorded history, but shortly after the formal establishment of the Foundation, this activity increased sharply. Early statistical models suggested something coordinated behind a significant amount of anomalies, which was eventually confirmed in 1953. The Foundation then received actual communication from SCP-001 in early 1954 although records of this communication are limited to level 5 clearance. After receiving this communication, Project Serapis was initiated, aka SCP-2798, which helped to curb the effects of SCP-001 on Earth. Less new anomalies popped up during those years, and notably less anomalies of a high-impact nature. Project Serapis eventually failed, however, as we know and 001 resumed the full force of its effects in November of 2016. 
newly documented anomalies started cropping up, as well as the disappearance and reappearance of contained anomalies, now appearing in far more dangerous forms. The Foundation still has no idea what SCP-001 is, other than the facts that they are alive, occupy a plane of existence similar or identical to our own, display a form of intelligence similar to us, and possess an intimate understanding of human psychology. They also don't know why they're messing with us, or really how to stop it. We're then provided a list of situational updates from November of 2016, as SCP-001 resumes its full effects on Earth. The Foundation is clearly scrambling, as anomalies across the globe are going haywire. Stars start blinking out of the sky, a group of Bigfoot, SCP-1000, attack a city in Oregon and take it over, Foundation facilities become overrun and lost, and overall the Foundation barely contains the whole situation. What follows is a long list of anomalies that the Foundation has documented having been changed by SCP-001 in some way. As mentioned, SCP-001 has some way to make these anomalies mostly more dangerous and primarily harder to contain than before, seemingly for the purpose of making humanity suffer. I won't go over every single one of these, but they are rather interesting. SCP-063 was a plastic toothbrush labeled as the world's best toothbrush, which was capable of removing all dead and inorganic matter from existence that came into contact with its bristles. Now it has since disappeared, but an unidentified humanoid advertising itself as the world's best dentist has appeared. It appears at low-cost dental service facilities and is capable of generating a localized time anomaly, causing subjects to experience time at a much slower rate, with patients reporting dental procedures that lasted two to three days or longer. SCP-087 used to be an infinite stairwell at a university containing a hostile entity, but now it's an infinite stairwell at the Pentagon, with a hostile entity that has been observed to open the stairwell doorway on its own. SCP-106, the highly dangerous corrosive entity capable of kidnapping people into an extra-dimensional space, now displays much higher intelligence and has been observed speaking with research staff, as well as utilizing its dimensional manipulation properties to facilitate its escape. SCP-294 used to be a coffee machine capable of producing any requested liquid substance, but now it's only capable of producing beverages created by the Coca-Cola Company or its subsidiaries. Requests for other liquids aside from these will affect the Coca-Cola Company's stock price, with requests for non-edible items resulting in a sharp increase in trading. SCP-400 is a species of insect similar to the common pill bug that kills and infests the bodies of human infants in order to feast on human mammary secretions by releasing pheromones to alter parents' behavior. The changed version is similar in all ways, except that they will infest humans up to the age of 18, instead of just infants. SCP-662 was a small bell that, when rung, summons Mr. Deeds, a butler that will attempt to perform any task asked of him. Now, ringing the bell causes the user to be transported to a random, unknown location where they will be asked to perform a seemingly impossible task, and they will be anomalously compelled to complete it, regardless of the consequences. SCP-701 was a play known as the Hanged King's Tragedy that caused a number of anomalous manifestations when performed, generally resulting in the cast killing one another and audiences breaking out in violence. On November 3rd, 2016, with no advance notification, a television drama premiered on HBO called The Hanged King, with the first episode encompassing the first act of the play and featuring known actors. No anomalous phenomena have been observed in connection with the program otherwise, although the following day, the New York Times reported that the show had been renewed for five seasons. SCP-1165 was an alleyway that, when walked down in a certain direction, 
has a chance to lead into an extra-dimensional city space with no observable boundaries. Now it leads into a space populated by automated constructs designed to forcibly harvest human brain tissue. Drone explorations estimate the number of these constructs to be around 11.8 billion. SCP-1230 used to be a book that caused those who read from it to experience extremely vivid dreams containing fantasy narratives crafted by an entity known as the Bookkeeper. It's now a 2nd century manuscript titled The Infancy Gospel of Polyxena, which causes readers to experience detailed hallucinations in which they are present alongside a child possessing miraculous abilities, believed to be a depiction of Jesus of Nazareth. These hallucinations begin in a location described by a disembodied female voice as the Last Catacombs, and choices made in the hallucinations affect subsequent visions substantially. SCP-1322 was a small space-time anomaly that connected to a parallel universe, containing an advanced civilization that the Foundation eventually greatly offended and were afterwards determined to wipe us out. Unlike other affected anomalies, this one actually became safer, with the civilization on the other end apparently having closed their side of the portal. SCP-1440 is an old man that causes increasingly destructive events to anything connected to humanity around his person. Now the man retains the same effect, except its area has now extended to anything within 300 kilometers of him. SCP-1981 was a Betamax tape labeled Ronald Reagan Cut Up While Talking that features a recording of former US President Ronald Reagan delivering a speech while various wounds are inflicted upon him anomalously and occasionally a figure in black robes appears behind him. It's now a series of recordings that have been uploaded to the site Daily Motion featuring a skinless humanoid giving a speech at the World Economic Forum in 2013 in Switzerland. Voice recognition software and biometric data gives a 98% likelihood that this is Ronald Reagan, although the speech consists of technical specifications for as yet unknown technological devices. SCP-2317 is a wooden door and frame that leads to another reality containing a chained entity known as the Devourer of Worlds, although the chains are almost entirely broken, and the Foundation has no idea how to prevent the eventual release of this entity. The updated information for this file now says that SCP-2317 is not a threat to consensus reality and it will be removed from the Foundation database with no further resources or review necessary. SCP-2718 is a unique file, as it contains information about an incident related to the O5 Council in which one of their members experienced a fate after dying in which they were cognizant of everything happening to their body, with no hope of release. The file is perpetually on the SCP database somehow, but is normally hidden through a highly complicated process that only causes it to very rarely appear in view. This is done on purpose due to the extreme danger of the cognito hazards present. The note on the table in the 001 file says that before it provided a database error, as there was no entry present. Now it provides a database error, as there is an entry present. Finally, SCP-2845 is a deer entity originating from Saturn that is capable of transmuting and reconstructing matter at will. It is extremely dangerous and was contained through a highly extensive and complicated series of rituals. Now all contact with the site containing it has been lost, and no means of travel to or observation of the site are currently possible, with the status of the deer currently unknown. That was just a small sampling of the overall list of the changes among anomalies, and there's likely many more that aren't documented, but the bottom line is that this is a pretty big threat. The Foundation could certainly deal with a handful of these at the same time, 
but having so many become loose and enhanced is a big problem for both public awareness and the safety of humanity. If SCP-411 is to be believed, this will lead to the Earth becoming a barren planet, home to terrors beyond imagining, and our only hope is to flee this planet to a distant star, paid for with our suffering. In the next document, we're back with O52, sitting at her computer terminal. The Foundation has suffered more casualties in the past 24 hours than they have in the last 5 years combined. Despite this, she's maintaining her resolve, and her belief that there is a way out of this. She wishes she could tell each field commander that the Council was certain about this, and they just need to hold the line although she knows that desperation is a powerful tool, and the people of the Foundation know what the consequences of failure are. She then receives a video call from 053, and it seems that things did not go well in the recent council vote, with the council tearing itself apart. She taunts 053, asking her if losing the vote still makes her mad, but 053 just says that she's scared. 2 says that saying you're frightened isn't a good idea in this line of work, and asks what she wants. 3 accuses her of blocking the vote and swaying other council members to her side. 2 doesn't refute that, but says that 051 made the difference, and even she can't sway him. 053 says what's done is done, but 2 owes her. 2 says that she's beyond absurd if she thinks that she owes her anything for not letting the council kill everyone on the planet. 053 asks her to tell her the real reason why she didn't go with the mass suicide option, and 052 almost ends the call there, but instead reveals that she used some anomalies to glimpse into the future. As mentioned, these items are forbidden for the purposes of influencing decisions, thus why 052 was being so secretive. 053 is shocked, but 052 stands her ground and says that the prohibitions don't matter anymore, not with a gun in their mouths. 3 sits in silence for a moment, but doesn't argue, instead asking her what she saw. 2 says that at their age they've learned not to delude themselves with false hope, but they've always fought to preserve what is, never thinking about what could be. All of the precog anomalies showed her a utopian future, in which people live with no fear of sickness or death, and there's no war or poverty. All of the items she checked out showed her this place and she firmly believes that someone in humanity survives to make it there. 053 is, quite naturally, skeptical of what she's saying, as they're staring down the greatest threat to humanity they've ever experienced. 052 says that it's definitely on a different planet, and even though they might not be able to escape this situation now by flying into space, she believes that at some point, someone does. She's fighting to give that chance to them, rather than just killing off all of humanity in one swipe. 053 continues to be skeptical, suggesting that she's possibly making these visions up just to prevent the mass suicide, but 052 has no reason to do so, especially since she didn't bring this up during the vote. It's possible that one or two of the anomalies could have fabricated these visions for some reason, but not all of them as some of them are even kept in separate realities. 053 mentions that they've already had two activations of SCP-089 in the last two days. 089 is a talking statue that can cause devastating disasters or mass genocides unless a mother willingly burns their infant child inside of the statue. These events don't happen often and of course it's an incredibly terrible thing when the statue does activate and demand a sacrifice, so for two of these events to occur in two days, it's a heavy toll, and a warning sign of things to come. 052 says that she'd rather not know about things like that, but nothing they have to do now is any different than what they've had to do before, 
it's just harder. The Foundation has always tried to preserve some sort of future, and now they have proof, so they can't stop. 053 still isn't fully convinced, but hopes that 2 knows what she's doing. 2 asks her to help hold things together until they can't do it anymore, so that whoever is fated to escape from here can do their duty. 053 wearily nods and ends the call, leaving 052 to sit there and hope that she knows what she's doing as well. As is so often the case, the Foundation is staring down the barrel of humanity's extinction, and they're not quite sure what to do about it. Some of them have hoped that they'll escape this nightmare and make for greener pastures, but that goal seems so far away at the moment. In the meantime, they have to deal with an intelligent, anomalous enemy hell-bent on making Earth ground zero for an apocalypse by supercharging every anomaly in existence. Who exactly is this enemy? Why do they care so much about destroying humanity, and how exactly will humans make their way to a utopia on another planet? These questions will have to wait to be answered in part two.